Well, good morning, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ. Special welcome to anyone who's visiting us this morning. We're grateful to have you here with us as well. I love the Lord's Day, but even more so when we partake of the Lord's table together. And that will be our privilege this morning at the close of the service. By the grace of God, we find ourselves in probably the richest passage I've studied in my life to prepare our hearts to remember the sacrificial death of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so I pray uh, that God would meet us in power and do more than we could ask or hope. So let's go to His throne of grace as we look at this jewel that God has for us this morning. Father, we do come before You, and what a privilege to gather together with Your people, to come right into Your presence, loved and accepted. God, we rejoice in the Lord Jesus Christ. We glory in His cross. For that is the only way you could be just and justify the ungodly. Lord, we thank you for him, and I pray he would be the ground and foundation of all of our worship this morning. I pray as we open up this verse, Lord, we need your spirit to reveal it to our hearts. God, teach us from the word of God, and let there be an abundance of exalting at the close of our service. And it's in Christ's name that we do pray. Amen. Well, we've spent much time in the book of Romans. If you'll turn to Romans chapter 5 is where we are this morning. And we've been laboring to understand justification by faith in Christ alone, that we can stand before God accepted, loved, clothed in the righteousness of Christ, and beloved by our God. Martin Luther said, it's the doctrine that the church stands or falls on. You lose this doctrine and everything comes apart. And so this is our great hope. Justification 5 1, Romans 5 1. Therefore, having been justified by faith, because we stand in this condition now of being justified, it's not in the future. The minute we believe, we are justified before God. And so now, chapter 5 is moving forward. Therefore, in light of the fact that we have faith and we are justified before our God, what is our new relationship with God? What do justified believers enjoy? What are our privileges? And the answer thus far is worthy of complete surrender and praise to our God. While justification really brought us into the courtroom of God, it was a judicial rendering that you're standing before the judge of the universe uh, is not guilty. And you were shown how God could be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Christ. And now Paul is bringing us into the heart of God. Not just our standing, but our relational uh, aspects to God. So instead of enmity, which we learned in Romans 1 through 3, we now have peace with God. Instead of wrath, he showed we were all under the wrath of God. Now we stand in the grace of God. We stand in his love and his favor. Instead of hell for all of eternity, this train is bound for glory. Don't take nothing but the righteous and holy. He's going to bring us to that eternal state. And now we don't receive retributive justice for our sin, but the loving discipline of a father to purify and strengthen our hope in glory. Verse 11, we get God. We get reconciliation. This morning we're brought into the deep, deep love of Jesus. We are brought into Trinitarian love by this gospel. So what justification has brought to the believer cannot even be fully expressed by God's Word. We we need His Spirit to communicate it to us through His Word. And we need glorification to finally take it all in is where we're headed. And so this morning, I'm going to outline our our section this way. In Romans 1-2 through is the blessed reality of what's come. We stand in grace. We have peace with God. We're going to glory. In verses 3-4, through We're going to look at this blessed perspective of how to think then about tribulations in our life, that we can actually exult and rejoice in tribulation. And now this morning, we'll look at blessed assurance in verse 5. Last week, amidst wind and cold and blowing tents and microphones popping and you guys just shivering, we began looking that we not only exult in the hope of glory but we exalt in our tribulations. 
We're a people who can actually, the same way you rejoice in peace with God is the same way we can exult in the trials that God brings into our life to purify our hope and our joy and where He's taken us. And He said this hope will not disappoint. You'll never stand before God and be disappointed if you hope in Christ. It's certain. It's sure. It's the only thing you can hope in that you won't be disappointed. I've said before, all other hopes are dying hopes or dead. This is a living hope. And on that last day, you won't be disappointed when you stand before the throne of God. So this morning, how can we be certain of this hope? How can we be certain certain that it won't disappoint us? Our whole life is filled with disappointments. How will this one be any different? And Paul's going to answer that for us, and his answer is short and simple, but it's so profound it will take the rest of our lives and eternity to just keep learning it. And his answer, if you look at me in verse 5, is because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts. And so my joy this morning is to try to help you understand what Paul means by that answer And I think it's probably the best answer that could ever be given as to why our hope will never disappoint us. So here's your outline for this morning. We're going to look at two manifestations uh, to us of the love of God. And first, we're going to see God's love poured out in our hearts. And this morning, I'm going to show you that that's a very subjective thing, and it's done by His Spirit. And then secondly, we're going to look at God's love poured out into the world in history, and it's a very objective thing that His Son came into this world to die for sinners. So here's what I would like to do this morning. I want to explain both our points, and then I'm going to close out. If you look in verse 5, is the word, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts, because is the application. How we exult in our tribulations. The hardest part, I believe, of the Christian life is to exult in tribulation. I'm good at exulting in grace and peace and glory, but my battle is exulting in tribulations, so I need help to hope to exult in the midst of them. And the answer is the because, and that's going to bring exulting and singing in every believer's heart that's here or at home this morning. So let's take a look at our first point then. God's love poured out in our hearts in verse 5. Hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit (coughs) who was given to us. So when we began this epistle, in Romans 1, 7, Paul says, I'm writing to all who are beloved of God in Rome. And I said then that that was going to be a key to this gospel. And then we spent three chapters on God's wrath. Paul revealed, he said, God's wrath is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. And then we began looking at the work of Christ, but now how Jesus came into the world and lived the life we should have and died the death we deserved and now can make us stand justified, righteous, accepted before God. And now we see Paul takes up the love of God in verse 5 the first time that it's been mentioned since the introduction because there's a journey to his love and it goes through the cross of, of Christ to where his love has climaxed. And so he's been showing it to us and now he's going to draw out this is the love of God. And so the first order of business as we begin then, what is the love of God? And as we look at this in verse 5, it can be translated two ways. It's called a subjective genitive or an objective genitive. And it depends which one it is and the context has to tell you. One means that it's God's love for us that's poured out in our hearts. The other is it's our love for God that's been poured out into our hearts. And the two are very married, but I believe that Paul's focus is very specific. It must be answered, what does God pour into our hearts? His love for us or our love for Him And the subjective genitive is it's God's love for us because context has to determine it. And what is the context? Paul is seeking to assure us in tribulations of God's purpose and love, our confidence and our favor and our hope that it would not be disappointed. And quite simply, if my assurance and hope 
were based on my love, I'd, I'd be in big trouble. <laughs> my, my love rises and falls. It's feeble. It wavers. It's my battle my whole life. My certainty and hope cannot rest on my own affections for God. That's a bad foundation for hope. It wouldn't be much encouragement, amen? But more importantly, in verses 6 through 8, it's connected with a 4. And that means Paul's explaining what he just stated. He's given us more explanation. And his explanation is that God demonstrates his own love toward us and that while we are yet sinners, Christ died for us. And then Paul's going to argue and close out his whole argument in chapter 8 and say nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, including trials and tribulations. Nothing can separate you from this love. And so it's God's love for us that we're going to look at this morning. But again, we love because he first loved us. And so what is this love? And I gave you some aspects way back when we began in Romans 1, 7 of this love. And they're worth repeating. And I'm going to add some more because my life just keeps growing and understanding the love of God in Christ Jesus. So just kind of journey with me. I'm going to give you some bullets. Uh, all of them are worthy of months and months of study in your own heart. And I pray that you might do that. What is this love? It's Trinitarian love. Eternally, our God was a God of love. And the Father, Son, and the Spirit enjoyed each other in a deep, infinite love. Just love overflowing and abounding affections for one another. 1 John 1, 4, God is love. And it overflows in the Trinity. And so God sends His Son in love to make the love of the Father known. And Jesus is born in this world and he, He's love incarnate. And the Son reveals that the that the Father who sent Him is love. And Jesus reveals to the world the God of love. If you've seen Me, you've seen the Father. And the Spirit is sent to communicate that love to us. And how does He do that? By revealing the Son to us, who in turn reveals the Father to us, who is love. And so I just want you to see the love of God. It's just Trinitarian and that's the love that we're talking about this morning. The love of God. The eternal triune God has poured into our hearts the very love that exists between the Trinity. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pour it into your heart. Secondly, we said the love of God is uninfluenced. God does not love us in return for ours. It, it's not us that makes God love us. It's God that sets His love upon us. Thirdly, the love of God is eternal. There's never been a time that God hasn't loved you, child of God. It started in eternity past. It goes to eternity future. It's an eternal love. It's sovereign. It's, it chooses whom it will set its love upon. It's infinite. There's a depth and a height and a length and a breadth that you just can't measure it. Your sin can't go away from the love of God. It's immutable. This love is unchanging. It's not based on you. It's not based on your performance. It's a love that it doesn't go up and down. It's perfect. It's a love that's holy. For those whom the Lord loves, He disciplines and He scourges every son whom He receives. It's a love that's devoted to purifying us. It's a love that's sacrificial. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son to it. The love of God is joyful. This is not, I, I love you, but I don't really like you. Zephaniah 3.17, The Lord your God is in your midst. He's a victorious warrior. And He will exult over you with joy. He will be quiet in His love. And He will rejoice over you with shouts of of joy. It's a joyful, it's not a begrudging love, it's a rejoicing over us kind of love. It's an unbreakable love. It's not based on how well I do or how bad I do. It never changes. There's nothing that can separate me from it. There's nothing outside of me. There's nothing even created that could separate me from this love. 
It's generous. It's abounding in loving kindness. But God being rich in mercy because of His great love with which He loved us, He caused us to be born again. It's not stingy. It's an inexhaustible fountain. I came across an old hymn. It said, Could we with ink the ocean fill? Were the skies of parchment made? Were every stock on earth a quill? And every man ascribed by trade to write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry. Nor could the scroll contain the whole thou stretched from sky to sky. It's a demonstrated love. God demonstrates His own love toward us while we were yet sinners. It's a singular love. It was a love, a very specific love for His people. It's a surprising love. Who He set it upon should cause you to marvel the rest of your days. And it's a purifying love. It's devoted to make us spotless without blame or wrinkle on that last day when we see Him. So a definition is God's love is an exercise of His goodness towards individual sinners whereby having identified Himself with their welfare, He has given His Son to be their Savior and now brings them to know and enjoy Him in an eternal covenant relationship forever. And so I want you to take this in this morning. Saints of God. This love in verse 5, the love of God has been poured out within our hearts. Jonathan Edwards in his famous sermon, Heaven is a World of Love. He said the essence is because God is there. It's just going to be this place of eternal love. This love is there. And that's the glory that we exult in with hope. But this is saying that God brings heaven down, a Trinitarian love, into our hearts. This everlasting, infinite love He will pour out. <clears throat> it has a height and a depth and a breadth and a length that no one can measure. And it's been poured out within our hearts. And this word poured out, it means to be shed abroad. It pictures an extravagant and ab abundant effusion. It's a, a flood. The floodgates of heaven are poured into our hearts the love of God. Commentator Hodge said it's not a few drops, but it's a stream. It's filling the heart with the love of God. It's the same word used what Greg read this morning in Acts 2. The Holy Spirit was poured out upon the crowd at Pentecost. It's just poured out. The knowledge of the love of God is just poured out within our hearts. The heart is the center of our being and our personality, our mind, emotions, affections. It's mission control center, the most blessed place. The love of God is poured out in our, every believer. Every believer, this love is poured out in your heart. And later in Romans 8, Paul says, if you don't have the Holy Spirit, you're not a Christian. And so if you have the Holy Spirit, this love has been poured out in your heart. And so you need to hear this. This is in the inner part of the man or woman. It's subjective. Douglas Moo, the commentator, said it's even emotive. God loves me. And I just meet too many in the church that says God loves everyone but me. That's not the gospel. This is in the perfect tense. I think it's my favorite perfect tense in the Bible. And what that means to pour out that this love has been poured out at the time of faith and we are in the state of it being poured out. So a perfect tense is it's poured out with existing results. And I get to live into that glorious existing results every day of growing in the love of God that was shed abroad in my heart when He brought me to faith and this became real and that God loves even me. How does He pour such a thing out? Through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. The forgotten person of the Trinity. The Holy Spirit. Well, you, you, I've studied His attributes and no one even mentioned this one. He's the one who pours out in our heart the love of God in Christ Jesus. And that's why the fruit of the Spirit, the first one is love. 
He really is the forgotten person of the Trinity. In Reform circles, one man said the Trinity is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Bible. We've lost the Holy Spirit. And so please hear this. This is not something we conjure up. It's not some formula. It's not I, I base on premises or some deduction conclusions. Have you ever seen the old picture with the flower? He, he loves me. He loves me not. And you keep going to the last one is whether he loves you or loves you not. That's not the Christian life. It's not something that we deduce. God loves those who believe. I believe. So God loves me. That's not what's going on here in Romans 5.5. 5. This is something that the Holy Spirit does. And he pours the love of God into our hearts. And when he does this, we exult in glory and we exult in our tribulations. So this has to be big to get you to that place. Commentator Guthrie said it's not an audible voice, but it's a ray of glory filling the soul that you are greatly beloved by God. The consciousness of the soul is told to you by the Holy Spirit. You are greatly loved by God. So this isn't a happy buzz, a spiritual high. It's more than enlightenment. It's more than the enrichment of the soul. It's more than just knowledge. It's more than holy laughter. But it is the Spirit of God revealing truth that I'm loved by God. And it's the Spirit giving abundant assurance of the love of God to us in Christ Jesus. I want you just to hear what he's going to write in a few chapters in Romans 8, 14. For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you received the spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father, nearness, He loves me. He's not just a creator, He's my God, He's my daddy. Abba, nearness, communion, peace with God. And the Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we're children of God. I'm loved by God. He's my Father. He bears witness with my spirit of this truth. 1 John 4.16 We have come to know and have believed the love which God has for us. God is love, and the one who abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. We have come to know and believe the love which God has for us. How? Because the Holy Spirit shed it abroad at your salvation. And he continues to shed it abroad and reveal this glorious love to you. And so this is subjective. The Holy Spirit pours it into your heart to where you pull a Wesley and you say, even my sins have been forgiven. It goes from dead externals, just a cold written word, to the gospel that because of Jesus Christ, God loves you. Martin Lloyd-Jones says this is the highest form of assurance that you can have. It brings it home to the heart to the soul of man. And so do you see this morning what this is saying? Maybe what it attacks. It attacks the intellectualism of our day and throughout history. People say it's nothing but the the truth. I'm just full of doctrine. I study. I listen to great preachers. I read the reformers. But your religion is just in your, your head. It's in your being. Christianity to you is a set of beliefs and truths. And I just try my best to live by them. I try to be a good person. But I have no love for God and I have no love for other people. It fills the church. Some of you are right here this morning. 
Because quite simply, the love of God has never been poured out in your heart. Tribulations make you question God. And they make you mad at Him. And they make you doubt Him. Because He's just a theory, He's just a truth that's supposed to make your life better. He's not a God who's my Father who loves me. That's the only way you can exult in tribulations. Every time tribulations come, if you don't have this, you will doubt God. You'll question and you'll push him away and you'll be bitter. But the one who knows this can embrace the loving hand of a father who's purifying and strengthening your hope and leading you to glory. I've never seen that connection clear that you need this love of God shed abroad in your hearts to exult in tribulations. Because I've seen it over and over again. You never will if you don't know this. Tribulations anger you. I've been praying that 2020 would be a revival of our hearts and maybe break into the whole world. And so here it is this morning. Some of you come week in and week out and this has never happened to you. You know nothing about what I'm talking about. And so you play at it. And you never enter into the beauty of what Christ has purchased for you on Calvary's tree. A God who loves you infinitely poured out into your heart and it pours out into every heart then you come into contact with. You're selfish and lost in yourself because the love of God hasn't set you free. And I've prayed this day that the Holy Spirit would pour into your hearts the love of God in Christ Jesus so that you could become one with Him. Your whole life is growing in the understanding of the height and the depth and the breadth and the width of the love of God in Christ Jesus that surpasses knowledge because the Holy Spirit pours it out into your hearts. And I, I just see this distinction on a daily basis. And you look at the Gospel and you quit being a working one to get the love of God. And as a shepherd, I see it. If you're trying to be a working one to get the love of God, you, you'll never get there. You're going to always be insecure and battling and struggling. When you finally will quit working and believe God, you will be justified and the love of God will be shed abroad in your hearts. But the churches are jammed full of working ones to get God's love. The love of God will be poured out in your hearts or you will spend your whole life trying to clean up and make yourself better to get God to love you. Are you weary and heavy laden with that? It's the most miserable time of my life trying to labor to get God to love me. And here it is, quit working and believe in what God's message is and the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be loved by God and you'll be justified and brought in as a child of God into this love relationship. Let's flush this out just a little further. I could go on that all, all night, man. I love it. The Spirit pours it out now. What I want you to see in our second point is by revealed truth. So it's not just God puts something in there and you're like, how, how do I know He loves me? He, the Spirit works through truth. And the question is then, what truth? How does He convince me? How does He shed this abroad in my heart? What is the truth that He uses? And the answer is very simple in verse 6. Four, there's your connection. There's your explanation. <clears throat> in verses 5, uh, verses 6 through 8 of chapter 5. So God, our first point, God poured out His love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. And the second point is God's love was poured out into the world in history objectively by His Son. <clears throat> he died on a cross on Calvary on this earth. And there's how the two marry and work together. His Son came into the world as fully man and fully God. 
He was born of a virgin. He really went up on a cross and he went willfully. And he died for me, for me, a helpless, unworthy, ungodly sinner. One who did deserve the wrath of God forever. And he bore the wrath, he bore the blame. It's objective content. And the Spirit comes and illuminates that to us. I read this, and I know that I'm loved by God. I'm convinced by the Holy Spirit. The flood comes with abiding results, a perfect tense. It just keeps coming. A community group, a, a few weeks ago, I was just worshiping with them and singing, and it just overwhelmed me, and my heart was just so filled with God's love. Times at the table this morning where you remember, and you, you're just like you're right there at Calvary again. John Murray said, you're captivated and controlled by the love of God that I have divine affection and love for me. Robert Haldane said, a sinner's heart can hear 10,000 times of the love of God and never be properly affected by it until the Holy Spirit pours it out into your hearts. You can hear teaching till the cows come home and never get this. Floods our heart with the knowledge of the love of God in Christ Jesus. The Spirit has made me feel it so. We're flooded with a sense of His great love. The great theologian Jonathan Edwards, who was known for his brilliant mind, but his beautiful heart. He said, it's not enough to have the right opinion about the love and grace of God. It's not enough to know the doctrine about it, but you need a sense of it and to experience it. But it's real for you. It's for me. And as we look at this historical reality in the Bible, we see this love put on public display. In verses 6 through 8, four times it talks about the death of Christ. How do I know God loves me? I look at the Son of God dying on a tree in my place. Look with me in verse 6. And when I come back from vacation, we're going to take these up. Uh, I'm just going to move through them in a survey to close this out. <clears throat> four, explanation. While we were still helpless, Romans 1 through 3, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man someone would dare even to die. But God, and I love this demonstrate. it's in the present tense, it's a hard thing to translate. God is demonstrating His own love toward us. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Spirit takes that and He sheds it abroad in your heart. That while I was helpless, ungodly, a sinner, Christ Jesus went up on a cross and He died for my sins. I, I don't know what could show you the love of God any greater than the, the cross of Calvary. And the Spirit sheds that into your heart that He died for me. So get this. Paul is saying this experience poured out into our hearts by the Holy Spirit does not do an end around your head. Okay? It doesn't ignore the truth. It is by the truth of Christ and His death on a cross that the Spirit uses it to shed it abroad in your heart. This is a feeling and a fact. It is Spirit and it's truth. So here this Christianity is meeting with God and His love not some logical equation or doctrine about him. It's more than that. It's bigger than that. I had a guy once tell me, he said, I, I, I became a Christian because I'm a scientist and I figured out that evolution is wrong and therefore I'm a Christian. No, you're not. That's not salvation. Salvation is the love of God being shed abroad in your heart as you see the Son of God dying in your place. It's the Holy Spirit love of God experientially. It's a concrete truth. It's a doctrine. It's a reality of Christ Jesus. In fact, it will fill, fill your head with the Word of God. And the more blessed you will be by the love of God being poured out within your hearts. The more and more I learn of this Bible, the more the love of God keeps having that abiding result in my mind and in my heart. 
And I'll tell you this, just to help balance, it will be different in every heart. And it's going to look different. I don't have a carbon copy. Different personalities. It's going to look a little different. But it's always going to be that. It can begin as a mustard seed and it can grow into a huge tree. It can begin as an inferno. I've just seen it start different in a million ways. But as we come to the table this morning, this must be more than doctrinal to you. And as you remember the cross... That the love of God has been poured out in your heart. That's the faith that we join our hearts together at the table. And you can lose your sense of it because of wrong thinking, putting yourself back under the law, sin, apathy. There are, there are things that can hurt this and grieve the Spirit to where you're sitting here going, I feel so cold to the love of God. What's happened? And the message for you this morning is to repent and remember your first love and let that come and fill your heart again. That God, that His love's so deep that your apathy and sin can't even get you away from it. His love will hunt you and pursue you and come after you. Let that overwhelm you that, that you, your, your lover keeps chasing you and hunting you and seeking. You can't sin outside of His love. What a beautiful time at the table. And then one last thought. I'm very scattered, but I'm excited. I've had some of you who were raised by bad dads and they, they gave you a terrible example of the love of the Father. And some people I've seen that say their whole life they, they can't get this because of their father. And i got good news for you. It doesn't say that your dad shed it abroad in your heart, his love, but the Holy Spirit does. And he can break through a lifetime of bad example. You don't have to live in bondage your whole life to a dad who affected you. The Spirit can go right into your heart and show you the love of God this morning in Christ Jesus. Isn't that beautiful? You're not stuck in that bondage. Boom! Let's wrap up. My favorite word, not my favorite word, but I like this word, because... The love of God has been poured out because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts. Because. That's how hope will not disappoint. That God poured out His love for us on Calvary. You look at the tree and you see the love of God and then He pours it out into my heart by the Holy Spirit. God loves me. And we've seen that you're justified. When you believe this, you can have confidence on the last day and hope of glory. And this love then sustains me in my suffering. That He is for me and He's not against me. He's a loving Father doing me good. And in His great end is to transform me into the image of Christ. And He loves me way too much to leave me in my sin and my false loves. This love, it's too pure to let you hope in something other than Him. To let you continue in your sin. Just rejoice that His love will keep coming to purify and make sure you make it to glory and don't destroy yourself. Oh, the basis of the love of God. And one other possibility is I, I have a present experience when He sheds abroad in my heart His love of the great reality of what's coming in glory. What I've tasted in this life of His love can you imagine what is coming when you go right into glory, into the fullness of Trinitarian love with no more sin, doubts? It's, it's unbelievable what's coming for you in heaven, a world of love. This is a foretaste of heaven. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. So in my suffering, I have this taste of God's love that I can exult that He's filling me with more love through tribulations. And that love will not let me go. And it will bring me to glory. And his whole argument is going to be nothing can separate you from it. Trials and tribulations don't separate you from his love. Nothing can separate it. And I will drink it endlessly with no more disruptions or deceptions or distractions for all of eternity. Oh, what wondrous love is this. And a God who brings me into tribulations. 
What a gift. I love that last week on tribulations, this whole thing's blowing off and it's just ridiculous. And this morning, the sun is shining like God's love all over you. I didn't plan that. It just happened. Do you guys want a quote from John Owen or do you want me to save it for another week? I don't know how I'm doing on time, but I'll give you it. Two quotes and then we'll close. John Owen, the great Puritan, sort of the greatest mind of the 1600s. Unacquaintedness with our mercies and our privileges is our sin as well as our trouble. To not know this love of God. We hearken not to the voice of the Spirit given to us that we may know the things that are freely bestowed on us of God. This makes us go heavily when we might rejoice. You're just you're weighted down when you could be walking around rejoicing. And to be weak where we might be strong in the Lord. Out of great personal experience and the observation of many Christians, says Owen, how few of the saints are experientially acquainted with this privilege of holding immediate communion with the Father in love. How few get it that you're in, in the communion with a God who loves you. With that anxious, doubtful thoughts, do they look upon Him? What fears and questioning of Him? What questionings of His goodwill and His kindness? At the best, may think there is no sweetness at all of Him toward us. But we were purchased at the high price of Jesus. And it's true, that alone is the way of communication. But the free fountain and spring of all is the bosom of the Father. The Father Himself loves you. This last quote is about a great pastor named Charles Simeon. <clears throat> There's a man, Henry Venn, who wrote him a letter after the death of his dear wife. He said, I am now a living witness of the truth that you so strenuously maintain and of the necessity of that the truth in our miserable condition here below. Did I not know the Lord is mine? Were I not certain His heart feels even more love for me than I am able to conceive? Were not this evident to me? Not by deduction and argument, but by consciousness. By His own light shining in my soul as the sun doth upon my bodily eyes. And to what a deplorable situation I should have now been cast. I have lost all that I could wish myself to have been in the partner of my cares and joys. And I lost her when her industry and ingenuity and tender love and care for her children were just beginning to be perceived by the two eldest girls and to strike them with a sense of the excellencies of such qualities in his wife. I've lost her when her soul was a watered garden when her mouth was open to speak for God, and he was blessing the testimonies that she bore to a free, full, and everlasting pardon in the blood of Jesus. Nevertheless, I can say all is well. Hallelujah, for the Lord God reigneth. At all times, in everything pertaining to me, let God do what seemeth him good. Were there no Holy Spirit now to strengthen me mightily, were there nothing more than dependence upon the word of promise, without an almighty power and agent to explain, impress, and imply it, how my hands would hang down and my knees would be so feeble that I should faint and fall under the pressure of the cross. I bound in hope through the power of the Holy Spirit who's been given to me. And I rejoice in tribulation from the experience I now have more than I possibly could in a less severe trial, that the man of sorrows is as rivers of water in a dry place, and he giveth songs in the night. The Holy Spirit is revealing the love of Christ to me in a way in this trial that I could have never known. Therefore, I exult in my tribulations. No one tastes glory in his love deeper than his afflicted ones. Since I've been a pastor at the beginning of tribulation, many of us will say, when is this going to end? And then later they say, I don't want this to end because the love of God is filling my heart and my hope of glory like never before. Don't you want that? Therefore, I exult in my tribulations. And I exult in the hope of glory. Amen?
The love of God has been shed abroad in my heart. Let's pray. Oh, Father, I thank You for these glorious words. And I thank You that what we could never learn on our own, Your Spirit comes and reveals and pours out into a heart that could have never got this, a mind that could have never understood this. And You said, let there be light, and Your Spirit revealed Your love by putting Your own Son on a cross, the love of Christ dying in our place. Redeeming love now has been my theme and shall be till I die. God, I pray that every heart here is overwhelmed with such love. And God, the simple application is we love because He first loved us. Now as we come to the table, God, we come full of love to You for You so loved this world that You did give Your only begotten Son. God, we thank You for the salvation in Him. And we come shoulder to shoulder with a like faith in this with a love for one another now that overcomes all of our warts and sins and defects. God, we feel a deep, deep unity and love to this Christ that we share the love of God. God, let our time now at the table be rich and full of glory. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.